to the Morse Code Podcast, featuring conversations with entrepreneurially minded creatives in music, film, and writing. My name is Corby, and I'm hoping these little talks inspire you to push deeper into your own work, whether you're a full-time professional or just curious about what it's actually like to live as an indie creative. This week's episode is sponsored by Typecast Pictures, a production and consulting group based in Nashville, Tennessee, whose mission is to redefine how underrepresented groups are seen in film and television. Visit typecastpictures.com. I'm really excited to introduce this week's guest, a gifted singer-songwriter named Liz Longley. Liz is best known for her incredible singing voice, but there's a careful precision to the songwriting that belies her emotional and really personal approach to making music. I've known and admired Liz for years. We even wrote a song together called If You Love Somebody, which you can find on YouTube. We're actually queuing it up right now for release in the near future on the rest of the platforms. What makes Liz stand out for me, apart from her formidable songwriting chops, is the intelligence behind her approach to building an independent career, one dedicated fan at a time. To wit, her fifth album, Funeral for My Past, made music industry headlines when her devoted fan base raised over $150,000 to help her purchase the rights to and independently release that record. Liz became the fourth most funded solo female musician in Kickstarter history. You can read all about it in Billboard magazine. In this wide-ranging conversation, we talk about that famous Kickstarter, as well as what got her started in music and songwriting in particular. Liz recently became a new mom, so we discuss the crazy challenge of balancing a creative life and parenthood. Liz plays a couple of songs, and then I get to sit in on one of her most popular tunes, If You've Got Trouble. If you get something out of the Morse Code podcast, please give us a subscribe. New episodes come out every Thursday. And now, here's my conversation with Liz Longley. Thank you so much for making time for me. Thanks for having me. This, this is I'm, awesome. I've been looking forward to this for so long. Me too. And um, there's this is a, going to be a, probably a wide range, ranging conversation about um, all things Liz Longley and music and, and otherwise. Um, and I thought maybe we could start with what little I know of your way back past, which is that I think that you're from Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And your folks, correct me if I'm wrong, they ran a small business. Do, yes. Do, do did and do. Did and do. And <laughs> some of that, like the crosses over. I, um, I don't know the nature of your, their business and you'll, you'll tell me probably, but, um, the, but running a business is a lot about, um, keeping track of things and, um, turning a profit. <laughs> yeah. And did that, uh, affect you when you were starting to think about going into this racket? Well, I think my parents are very practical. It had to be practical to have mm. a successful insurance agency. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not so fun, but also they are music lovers. So they just try to always help me balance the dreaming side and the practical side and mm. supported me in, in, um, as I started out music, they never let me doubt the path and, Definitely played momager and dadager sometimes. Mm-hmm. That was something I had to slowly grow out of and mm-hmm. say, "Hey, I think I'm, I think I'm old enough now to figure this out on my own." But, um, but they were, they were not only encouraging, but like also like, let's try to figure out how to make this dream come true. Yeah, and that's so that's like super parent. Status. Yeah, I mean, I started out playing with my dad's band. That's how I got started. Okay. <laughs> So they, I was gonna. That was gonna be my other question. Is like, is there a latent musical talent in the family? Oh yes, and so there yes. Is. My dad, my grandfather. My grandfather was an army band leader. My dad uh, went to college for trumpet. So, very much a musical household. And my mom, I always say that she peaked out as uh, a karaoke singer on a cruise ship one year, <laughs> singing "It's My Party" and I'll cry if I want to. So I'm living out her dream. <laughs> nice. Um, do you do karaoke ever? No, you- well, I did it once in Chattanooga. Yeah, like did, it's it's oh, yeah. it's so uncomfortable. It's the weirdest it's, thing. Why is it so weird for us? I think it's because we're too serious. Yeah, like, we're like, okay, here I am. Yeah, no, we're totally. Like, this is my moment. They're gonna okay, know. I'm a professional. I do this. I'm a professional, so I've got to. Um, yeah, not only is it uncomfortable for me, the one time I did it, I just watched a room full of people like drunk people having fun like it really uncomfortable (laughs) like why is this guy trying so hard um it was a Beatles song and um it wasn't by choice I was uh out with a 
this guy Jamie Kenny. Um, oh, who's a, you, yes. I don't know if you know him. He's in Nashville. He's, He's a known quantity. Yes. Um, yeah, amazing guy. And uh, and yeah, he was cutting loose at Santa's one night a little bit, and I was like wrapped up into this. And he's like, "You you got to do one. Come on!" And I was just like, "No, dude. I'm you know I'm just glad to be here. My usual move." And yeah, I, there was no getting out of it at the end. And I saw him be like. <laughs> So <laughs> kind of regret it. Yeah, whatever. You know, it's not for everybody. Um, so, OK, so you got why uh, it's one thing to sing and um, play. And it's another thing to write songs. And not everybody was like drawn into that. So what what was that? Um, mm. What was it that made you want to start writing songs? Honestly, Joni Mitchell um, mm. and seeing your Morse code um, poster. I love that poster because I'm a huge Volvo fan and my <laughs> first car was a Volvo. And that's where I learned Joni Mitchell's blue front mm. to back inside mm. and out. And just the way, I mean, I always love to sing, but I, the first time I wrote a song, I felt like that was, that was a part of me that had to be expanded upon. And um, when I was a, teenager writing these songs my dad would say well you, you can sing but you don't know how to write a song you know like and, mm -hmm. and I, in a very nice and supportive way and um and, <laughs> and how old were you like when you started 14 like, yeah okay, yeah yeah perfect. so he was like if you want to pursue music you gotta you gotta learn how to write so and I love to write creatively um and I was in a lot of writing classes so um when I wanted to go to college I thought I just want to major in songwriting and that's kind of when I really got into the whole craft of it. And you went to Berkeley mm -hmm. and were you under the tutelage of like, um, uh, Pat Patterson? Yes. Pat yes. Patterson. And Scarlet Keys. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, and okay. So this is great. Cause <clears throat> I'm, a, I'm a rube, uh, and I have no schooling <laughs> and, um, but I have cross paths with Pat and I love him and he's yeah. a character. Yeah. Uh, I do love a character. Um, and he's, you know, got this methodical approach mm -hmm. to songwriting. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's got like a enormous list of people that he's worked with and helped you. Yes. Gillian Welch is a great example. Mm -hmm. um, and what, however you want to put this, I'm just curious, like what was that? What did he, what, what was the first thing or what was something that he imparted on you or that kind of changed your approach to songwriting? Well, my favorite thing that he focuses on um, that always was important to me. I just didn't have the words to it and didn't have an awareness around it was phrasing. And so he talks a lot about just putting the emphasis on the right syllables, as simple as that such sounds. Such a big one, yeah, for him. It's such a big one. Yeah. And to have awareness around that, especially as a singer, my dad always talked about phrasing and, you know, pausing and just timing, but to also take that to the lyrical level um, was something that just hugely, it got yeah. in my head my in, in a good way. Is tangled all around you. It's like that's phrasing. I mean, that's I like, so, yeah. that's very intentional and in that having that balance between space and um, not space uh, is, it doesn't come intuitively, I don't think to everybody, maybe some people, but when you kind of notice it, then it's like, oh, I yeah. will say that I got that one hammered into me about the, um, the syllables uh, yeah. <laughs> from Patterson at uh, Folks Fest, oh, yes. know, song school yes. at Folks Fest one year. And um, I, for a while, I was just like, could not get that out of my head and I could yeah. not make a syllable not land right um, without being <laughs> like, oh, Pat. <laughs> um, I've grown out of it a little bit because I, I think too. it's okay. It's yeah. okay now and then. And yeah. also you notice some really um, big songs come around oh, once yeah. in a while that are like, okay, that totally. wasn't, that's, they didn't take that Pat's class. <laughs> um, Sometimes so, it drives me crazy, but other times I don't notice it. But yeah, yeah, uh, interestingly totally. for um, Patrick, my husband took uh, read Pat's books and he he really can't get it out of his head. So like he'll hear something and that I've just written and go, yeah, but like, why did you like, and I'm like, what? I don't even hear it anymore. So yeah. I, I'm not as fresh with it, but, um, I still get the, my finger slapped with a ruler. Yeah. You know, well this, <laughs> this is, it's kind of like there's a double edged sword with any sort of training, um, any sort of training, yes. you know, which is that it does start to be kind of a rule that you have to like, but then you can break with. it. Yeah. You can break it, but you kind of, it's like the step is like ignorance and you're just stumbling forward and yeah. blissful unawareness of that. You're doing anything wrong. And then you're like, Oh, then you notice a bunch of things that uh, and then you start to incorporate that. And then you kind of have the third step is like, okay, I know that, but I'm just going to play this chord now. I know that doesn't yeah. seem, that's not right, but it feels right. Right. Um, I noticed that like, when I was uh, a young man and I was really into bluegrass music and I was like a Tony Rice junkie and I, for, for, oh. forever I tried to, tried to be Tony Rice and 
failed miserably long story short and uh but in the meantime i was just all it all in that stuff and i was just like learned all the solos on hot dog like on minor swing and i would it was so interesting and i had this happen time and time again where it, the first time i heard something like a guitar lick or a cool chord progression it was like mis mystical it was like whoa what what is that and it, it was that very thing that made me want to learn it you know because it was like i want to know i want to know i want to capture that i want to do that it wasn't capture it was like i want to do that and then the second i would learn that song the mystery is utterly shattered once and for all you know what i mean it's like i knew how to do it now and it was fun to do but that thing that like drew me to it was like no, it was different. I want to say it was gone. It, that's not quite right, but something like learning the thing, having mastery over the thing, not that I have mastery over bluegrass flat picking, but having mastery over some aspect of something kind of turns it to, like, takes away that, that mystery. And now it's mm -hmm. like part of what you can do. And then maybe, maybe it's like when you do it to other people that don't know, that haven't studied it, then they get to enjoy that mystery. Mm. Um, maybe that's a theory of why yeah. it, it you're passing persists. On you're the, passing something yeah. on. Yeah, that. I that never thought about it that way. Um, okay, so you were at, at Berkeley and you were learning, but also you were in Cambridge, Boston, mm -hmm. and in the mix, mm -hmm. the storied mix of <laughs> hallowed singer songwriter dumb since time immemorial. Just barely. I mean, I think about <laughs> like Club Passim was always the venue I just wanted to play. I just wanted to get in. I yeah, couldn't get in, totally. couldn't get in. And then the way that I got in was doing, uh, they had a theme of like a Monday night music theme. It was, oh, what was it? Something 80s, maybe it was an 80s night. And you just had, and I don't know 80s music. It was, so I decided to pick some random, really hard uh, Carly song and I just butchered it. There was a modulation in the performance it, and I didn't get it. And nice. there I was just absolutely falling flat on my face my first time at Club Passim and I'm like, yeah, I did that. <laughs> but I mean, that- Was Matt there and- Yeah. Uh, okay, nice. Yeah, yeah so it's somehow great. I got past it. Yeah. But it was like, oh God. That's, that's so fun. I mean, uh, everybody wants to play there. We all want to play there. And also yeah. you think that when you're young too, that you've only got one shot. Totally. <laughs> like it's now or never. I'm at Club Passim. There's, <laughs> this is this is a 40 cap room. I don't know if I'm ever going to get this opportunity again. Um, little so do you know, true. you do have a few more tries if the first one doesn't go. Thank goodness. Um, okay. So when did you write um, your first record in Boston? No, I actually wrote my first record at home. Okay. And um, recorded it, I think, right after I graduated from high school. Yeah. But even before that, my parents were recently reminding me that, um, like, my dad would take me into the studio. Like, for my 17th birthday, he let me go, or 16th, let me go into the studio with him. And I didn't have my own songs. So I was, like, singing to tracks and stuff. No, no. At that point, I didn't. Anyway, I had my own songs, and I recorded them, just these dinky little acoustic recordings. And I put them on, burned them on CDs, printed labels and sold them at my school to raise money so I could go to Europe you for this hustler. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like my parents like, no, remember you so were, good. you were selling your CDs. I'm like, Oh, that's so embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, I think that that is, uh, there's something about our stripe. I'm going to put myself in your club for just a second. Um, which is, the, you know, the indie music thing that you have to get over, um, representing yourself in the need of making it pay. Like no one's going to do it for you. And yeah. all of us that have kind of persisted going forward have had to shed some of that, like, or all of that, like, I'm not good. Um, you know, maybe somebody can help me out and I'll, they'll do it for me. And I'll, no, you gotta, you gotta write the name on the CD. You gotta take the CD to school and you start, <laughs> you gotta start hitting up your classmates because it's not, the time is now. I mean, right. You know, it's funny that you're saying this because I am in, I'm in that phase again where I uh -huh. finally have the songs for my next record. I'm independent. I went independent in 2019, funded that record, got out of a bad situation. And here I am again. And I, I want to make a record and I don't want to ask again. And yeah. it's such, and I'm like, well, maybe I'll just wait until, I mean, but, but, 
It's because I have too much pride. I don't want to ask again. It's uh-huh. embarrassing. Uh-huh. So I think when you do it so many times, you're like, hey, it's me again. Well, um, let's take a moment to fast forward to 2020, I think, when Funeral for My Past mm-hmm. dropped. Yeah. And that it was a r- remarkable story for anybody in the music business, but particularly in- independent people. Yeah. Um, and maybe you could tell uh, a little bit about what happened there. Yeah. So um, I was on a record label when I moved down to Nashville. I kickstarted a record independently. A, a label heard it, signed me on that, and released it themselves. Then I did another record with them called Waitlist. And then I did this one, handed it in, and the person who signed me was no longer there by the time I handed this record in. And very long story short, and lots of dramatic details taken out. Um, <laughs> basically, I was like, I handed in this record that I knew was my best work. And they said, we're not going to release it, but you can buy it back from us. So Harsh. I, yeah. And I'd already, I didn't know at that time that I'd have to buy it back. So we just made a record that they could afford it was $35,000 that they put into it. So I had to buy that back and I did not have that. So I launched mm-hmm. a Kickstarter and asked my listeners to help me buy this album. And they showed up in droves and mm. made me the fourth most funded solo female musician in Kickstarter history, which mm-hmm. was crazy. And what was that grand total that, that you managed to raise for that? $150,000. Unbelievable. It was Unbelievable. crazy in 30 It gives days. me shivers even now. I mean, <laughs> I, and there was, I mean, it was widely covered in the press. Yeah. Like it was a crazy story. It really was. Um, and I was, I was wondering, cause I only saw this, you know, from uh, on the other side of the neighborhood, but I wondered, I was like, wow, that is such a win, a, you know, a blessing, a windfall. How is she going to manage that, all of that income and do, you know, put it back into her music? I mean, it's wonderful to have all that, yeah. all that money to spend. I'm just like, yeah. that's a lot to figure out. Yes, um, and was it, it was. a lot to figure yes, out? Yes, because I was, <clears throat> and I still am my own manager. So, mm-hmm. um, I had to be really smart about that. And I did, I spent I spent it. Yeah. Well, you'd been training your whole life for yeah. that moment, really. I did radio. I did a publicist. I just blew it out of the water mm-hmm. because that was my shot. And then mm-hmm. COVID hit. So. Great. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's a bummer. Um, okay. Well, this conversation is taking a life of its own because <laughs> now I want to say, but when COVID hit, um, maybe we can talk about that perhaps through the lens of your family changed. Yes. So you got married right before COVID. 2021. Oh, okay. Right after. The same year I did. Yes. Oh. We were supposed to get married in 2020, but COVID did that. Yeah. Right. Um, and then you are a brand new mom yes. shortly thereafter. Yes. So um, that's got to, I, I, not, I don't know, ch- I would assume change priorities, but definitely yeah. give, uh, give perspective on yes. everything. And um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on that or how that's changed you Uh, it's definitely changed me and just saying that is hard because before i had her when i was you know out to here pregnant i was like telling all my friends this is not going to change me and i think that was part of the problem is my denial of how much it would change me my fam my my friendships my marriage my career Mm -hmm. it just spills out over everything because i'm different um i didn't want to be but I'm embracing that now. And <laughs> well, you didn't want to be because you you were like, I'm going somewhere. Yes. I need to get there. That's yeah. what I've been doing my whole life. Right. And now it's That's nice that I have a kid. I will yeah. take her with me. <laughs> <laughs> and I will still work all the same hours. And, yeah. and I don't. And yeah. that's okay. Um, so yeah, it has been a huge priority shift. I love her more than I ever could have imagined. She is the greatest thing. So mm-hmm. um, I love spending time with her and I love mm-hmm. taking care of her and I have the great honor of being her mama. Um, but yeah, it's definitely put things in perspective of like, how do I do this and still, how do I have it all? I just yeah. want it all. Yeah. I want the career that I, <laughs> and I want the time with my <clears throat> precious family and and I'm just trying to figure out the balance of it. And I don't know if that's ever, I don't know if that's even achievable. achievable. Yeah. Um, I remember this is maybe like 10 years ago, we had this conversation and you know, you were like, f- maybe you just moved to Nashville and you, I mean, things kind of happened. Not, I don't know if it happened, but you know, you've always been on an upward trend and um, you had said like, yeah, you know, I don't want to just make a living. I want to make a good living. <laughs> and you were like, oh, you were going to, you know, you were like, I don't want to play clubs. I want to play theaters, you know? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't say that part probably, um, but that was, you know, what I took from it. And I was just like, yeah, damn. I mean, she is, she's going there. And I, you know, maybe like, like knows like or something, cause there's a bit of that in me. Um, 
uh, albeit without the business uh, acumen that, <laughs> that I, I could have. Um, so yeah, this is really interesting to hear because I don't think that you're, you know, like this is journey is a lifelong journey. And um, I, it, you know, this definitely probably modifies the approach, but I don't, I can't imagine you're fundamentally changed. You're still a very talented artist and you. You, with a desire to share, you know, there's a lot of talented people, but not everybody kind of burns with a desire to, to share that talent. And yes. I think that's another thing I've struggled with is like after she was born, I thought either the songs are going to spill in or I'm going to have to go fighting for them. And when am I going to have the time to claw them out? You know? Mm. Um, Cause I definitely struggle with writer's block. Um, and what did happen? They, <laughs> I had to claw and then they started spilling in. Mm. <laughs> um, and that's okay. I just had to have patience and, and um, trust that they would, they would happen. And I think when I first started writing, I don't know how to describe this other than what I was writing felt so soft and I just couldn't get into, I was like, I can't sing this every night, but I was so fragile. I mean, I was like a new mom, postpartum blues, all the things. Mm. And so my songs were just like, oh, this is, just, nobody wants to hear this, you know? And then I found out what I wanted to say about how motherhood has changed me. And I felt like I had something new to share where in my whole career, I've been like, I've branded myself as this person who sings about her failed relationships. And, mm -hmm. and that has, I mean, that has its limits. Mm -hmm. And so I'm in this great marriage and I don't, I don't know. I don't oh, sing a happy donk Dory song. Yeah. Who wants just, to hear that? Yeah. Who, <laughs> there has to be like some edges to it. I don't know how to describe yeah, it, yeah, but I, I think I finally found my edges. Um, and so I'm starting to lean into that. I don't know um, where I was going with that. But. <clears throat> well, speaking of leaning into that, maybe we could hear a song. Sure. Do you, do you, <laughs> do you know what you're going to play? I don't. Okay. Well then I won't ask you to set it up. We'll just, we'll just find out right <laughs> okay. now. Okay. So you got a job and bought a house and fell in love with someone else, all right, all right. Yeah, you're doing all right. You're doing all right. You and me, can we agree the best thing that we ever did was say goodbye? Mm, though it killed us at the time I've been thinking about the stupid mistakes that we made And maybe it wasn't all a waste All those nights we stayed up Crying, fighting through the hard shit Yelling at the top of our lungs Well maybe it was meant to be Cause I know I was part of the pain that got you where you are today and you're strong now that you're not mine you're doing fine so you heard my tires screeching came down the driveway screaming how you never love again do you know that's what you said that's what you said I couldn't get those sad words out of my head Now you can thank me for leaving For running out of reasons for giving up Or you can hate the heart that hurt you But I'm the one that showed you That baby you'd be better off You deserve a better love All those nights we stayed up Crying, fighting through the hard shit Yelling out the top of the lungs Maybe it was meant to be Cause I know I was part of the pain that got you where you are today And you're strong Now that you're not mine You're doing fine Na 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 ah, yeah oh. About the stupid mistakes that we made All those nights we stayed up crying Yelling at the top of our lungs
Well, okay, about the jaggedness of the songs, um, I, I can totally rate or let, let me get, hit, hit it this way because I too, um, w- I, it wasn't like a, I didn't brand myself as like a, a breakup singer songwriter, but I did enjoy having breakups and having failed relationships. I, there was something I enjoyed. Uh, I don't want to say that out loud almost, but <laughs> whenever it happened, I'd be like, Ugh. and sometimes it really, 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 really hurt. You know, yes. it was real hurt. And that was, it's very strange how that unlocks some of your best material. Uh-huh. Um, and that is also very dangerous because you can get a little addicted to that. And we all know people mm-hmm. that have kind of maybe fallen under that spell. And mm-hmm. then you wake up and you're 50 and you're like, oh, it's not as pretty anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, wow. And um, I, you know, I didn't really want to be that person. And I noticed also that um, I didn't, I can't, you know, um, Towns Van Zandt said there's two kinds of songs, blues and zippity doo dah. Mm-hmm. And I'd like d- done my version of blues for so long. And I didn't really want to go do zippity doo dah. But um, I, for me, like the songwriting thing was like, okay, well, what's out there to sing about that's not about me, you know? And I don't know if I'm any good at it, but I've definitely written some songs that I'm proud of that were, you know, topical is one way, but doing it. Or like, um, one, I really love hold on a second. She's still with, um, Robert Plant. She's a our hero. She's amazing. No. Um, she sings sweet Lorraine. That's the song that I'm thinking of. Um, sweet Lorraine. Oh, sweet Patty Griffin. Patty means? Griffin. No, but she's not still with him. Okay. Sorry. No, no. Well, I need to, that was yeah. very short lived. Okay. So <laughs> I, I was thinking about her the other day. I was like, damn, that's cool. She ended up with Robert Plant. What's that like? <laughs> It's like, I don't know, lasted two weeks. Um, Patty Griffin, though, is, you know, known for her character studies in her songs. And it's it's like um, Making Pies is such a great song, um, a timeless song and a character song, you know. Um, And I I never tried to do that. And uh, that was one thing that's like, oh, cool. You can have this life and live a happy life and be a committed person and make a family and pay your mortgage and be middle class. Um, and you can have, you can write beautiful songs mm-hmm. that as beautiful or maybe better than you've ever written before. It just takes a new kind of creativity, like actual creativity, like stepping out mm-hmm. and imagining how the world looks like from somebody else's perspective. And, um, I'd never, <laughs> my little, like right. myopic yeah. journey, I'd never really considered that. So I don't know if that's, um, anything that you, it sounds like, the, I don't know if you've dealt with that or, um, yeah, uh, I did. I thought about before I made a funeral, I had um, I had such a writer's block and I thought I'm just going to write. I'm going to interview a bunch of people and tell everyone's story in a song. And I didn't do it. But mm, to me, that is was three crow like, yours or is three crow fictional. That is mine. OK. Yes. But with like almost dreamlike fiction parts mm-hmm. that are symbolic. Mm hmm. <laughs> um, um well let's uh okay so i'm curious um, we, we broke from the chronology for a moment but um you had a moment in the northeast and you were always touring a lot it seemed like as soon as you could go you were going mm-hmm. and you built up a, i mean quite a following on your own like on the ground butts in seats like (laughs) the real way yeah you know and i i think that's probably i hazard a guess but i probably i don't think i'm wrong but that there's probably a direct line from that early part of your career and a hundred fifty thousand dollar kickstarter because you really did build those fans up one at a time and they're your fans and they love you as was demonstrated you know um so part of the purpose of this podcast is to kind of probably help some youngsters who are coming up um, and I know the industry's changed a lot, but, but sharing music in a room with people is, will never change. Yeah. Um, and so maybe you can talk about, did that experience, um, of your, the connection with your fans, um, was it intentional? Is it pretty natural? Was it kind of part of the business aspect of what, what you thought of or, um, your turn? Yeah. Um, Connecting with people has always been a very natural extension of playing music on stage for me. Um, I can remember being a teenager and getting off stage and someone comes up to me and my friend Sarah, Sarah Zimmerman of Striking Matches. We played together for five years Hmm. and somebody would just start telling us their life story and um, I'm all in. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just something that has always 
that's I'd rather be listening honestly than talking. For Even sure. in this, I'm like, can hey, relate. I'm talking so much. <laughs> um, so mm. yeah, that's to me that's very natural, mm. um, and it's just felt like a very natural connection with these people that come to my shows, and it's it's like they we're like family in some weird mm-hmm. way. Um, and I mean, having a house concert experience um, is uh, you know it just drives that home. If just yes. like especially you know. Uh, Maybe I don't think you do those too often anymore, but there was, I imagine a time when you did uh, many of them in a row even, and you just, you play a show and you probably sleep in the spare bedroom Mm -hmm. and then you come down and you have breakfast in the morning Mm -hmm. and then you hit the road and drive and do it again. I love it. And uh, yeah, you, I mean, these people are your friends. I have people around the world from my own experience of doing that very thing. And there's, you know, sometimes the house concert people, they're like, cool, thank you so much. Um, Really appreciated it. And you go on and sometimes you're like, I'm kind of sad to leave. Yes. And you stay in touch and, you know, you see him again and maybe not just to play a show. It's like you make these friends around the world. And that's one of the major blessings, I think, of this approach to making and sharing music. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you negotiate that, though, as the numbers grew? You know, it's one thing to have a fan base of a thousand or a hundred or, you know, but as you got bigger, you know, people are like, do they, you know, your email's probably readily available and people are each reaching out to you directly. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you deal with like people reaching out to you and feeling like, Oh, do I need to respond to everybody? And do I, and, um, that's, you know, I, I've had to deal with a little bit of that in my yes. own life, but I'm just curious. I feel a great responsibility to respond to everybody, but mm. as my life has changed becoming a mom, I simply do not have the time to yep. do it. So it becomes, if it's about booking me, it, it will get seen by either me or my agent. And I will pass everything along to Peter, which has made my life so much easier because I used to book all my own shows and do all the routing, which I love to do. Don't get me wrong. You're crazy. I'm still heavily involved in it. I'll call Peter. I'm like, hey, what if we did this? Da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just something that I find fun. I've Mm -hmm. always liked calendars. Um, but in responding to people, especially like on social media, that's, that's something that I feel responsible to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think there needs to be some kind of boundary because I've found myself in situations where I'm like, I need to dial it back here. This is too much. Like, yeah, I I won't go into that. Yeah. And I, I mean like people, I think that you find too, or I have found, um, in times in my life when I've stepped back and was not as available and didn't mm-hmm. like kind of maybe let things that your fans forgive you. They, they know that you have a life or that you're going through something or whatever. And especially if you've built a reputation on being communicative and open, yes. um, you know, they're not going to be like, wow, she's just like, I guess she thinks she's too good for me now. Or you know, I totally that, think that people think that though. You do. Yeah. Yes. I have a lot of guilt if I don't get back. Um, yeah. do you, th- I went to therapy. About yeah. I was going to ask, do you fit like this? We don't have to go there really, but, um, there. I, it's just interesting. Cause like, do you, what, I, I mean, we're all broken people, you know, in our way. And, um, there is such an element in this racket of, um, wanting to please people. You want to yes. be like, and part of that's you want to please, but you also want to be liked. And, but as an artist, there's this other thing where you're like, this is me and this is my perspective and I'm sharing this thing. And there's something like that. I think the inherent in the artistic experience of going against the grain, because otherwise you're just like everybody else. And, and if you're any sort of good artist, you're not like everybody else. So those those things seem contradictory to me. I think I want to be like everybody else. Hmm. I want to be accessible and I want to write songs that resonate with people besides me but that makes me want to be but you said earlier that you were like when you got back into this and you're writing these songs and you're like you use the word soft and you're like i can i can't imagine myself playing these songs night after night yes so there's i you know maybe i'm like reading into this too much or that would be like me um but uh it sounds you know there's something in you also that wants to make a song like a knockout you know what i mean and that like but in 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 what I mean by that though is like getting to like the gut punch of like why do I need to say this like if I write a song about motherhood and it's just like it's great it's beautiful it's lovely that's soft to me yeah yeah, but if I can be like it's great but here's how it's not Mm -hmm. but that's okay Mm -hmm. that to me has an edge Mm -hmm. now I'm like okay I'm in this is something that I can deliver to someone and be like hey it's okay if you felt this way too and also it's like I always want to present 
the light and the dark of a situation so that it feels relatable mm -hmm. because nobody is just happy all the time and songs aren't necessarily I don't know. That, I know. I totally, hundred yeah. percent agree. And it's like every could be. I think that what you, this is my paraphrase of what you're trying to say is that when you can write something that has a kernel of like sour in the sweet, mm -hmm. um, that is a closer reflection of actual human experience, exactly. and then it rings Thank truer. You. And it's right. like the same thing when you watch a movie, or, you know, and it's like saccharin. Yeah. Um, you're like, well, that was cute, but yeah. Ugh. Right. Or it, or you forget it, you know, more likely it's like those it's it takes a drama or a story or a song that has that thing where you're like, damn, you know, mm -hmm. like a true tragedy f feels like both inevitable and just like, oh, I, like a, I wish so bad it wouldn't have been. Mm -hmm. um, so, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And. Uh, well, it's a testament to your to your artistry and to your, I think. Um, still, as much as Liz Longley says that she wants to be like everybody else, <laughs> not everybody else thinks about writing a song. Like a lot of people try to write a song, but there's another layer of songwriting that has that kind of extra desire to be. I mean, um, he, when you've got trouble uh, is a pretty good example the, of a, a love song that opens up in the, like the throes of a hardship. Mm hmm. And it's, it's centered on, it gives me sh chills to think about. And it's so why that song is like, it just, that song is one of those few songs. And I've said, Robbie and I have talked about this. I, we talk about this song of yours. People talk about you, Liz. Um, <laughs> as this is a song, it was just like, will slay every person in a room every single time. Because it's got that, it's, it's got that thing of like, it's like everybody else. It's everybody's experience. It's universal. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a song that makes those couples that are feeling that have been married for 20 years that mm -hmm. like ugh, they're in their struggle and they hear that song. I bet that song has healed marriages and um, also probably been in the death knell on a couple of them too. <laughs> and uh, it's just that idea of, you know, you know, it's like you're, when you've got trouble, I've got trouble too. Oh my God, what a love song. And it, but it's power um, is connected directly to the hardship in a, in a relationship. So mm -hmm. great example of um, what you're talking about. Thank you. Um, let's listen to another song. Okay. Why okay. don't we do that one? Okay. <laughs> Intertwined, I'll ease your pain, cause you 
Gibson is beautiful. That was given to me. Uh, that was given to me at a house concert. This guy just um, <laughs> and I—it's one of—it's one of one of those friends and fans. I, I've opened for Emmy Kenny at uh, Eddie's Attic, and it was like she's from Walking Dead. She's like famous, oh, yeah. and I didn't know her. Yes, um, yes. and it was like sold out and lying around the room to wait oh and see her. Gosh. And that guy came to see her and saw me, play, and he likes this song I wrote called uh, "Old Shenandoah," this like old wailing song oh, wow. thing. And um, so I played his house a couple of times, and the second time I played his house, he just walked in, no case. He was just like, "I just never." And could you? And I was like, "Really?" <laughs> and it's awesome. It, that's oh that's that guitar God. has vibe for days. Yeah, it looks like it has vibe for days. Um, okay, I'm looking at my some of my notes, and let's see. We, we touched <laughs> on uh, freedom from my past. Um, uh, the connection to fans. I was interested in that. Um, what compelled you? Oh. This is kind of okay. Two more topics, and then we can we can be done. Um, but I feel like if we do this all day, yeah, this is really fun. <laughs> it's like breathing. Um, when you moved to Nashville, did you find what was that experience like from a songwriting perspective? Did it change your approach, and how did you negotiate that? Oh, for me, it was such a, oh, something I really struggled with moving here. I felt very. I felt pressure mm. to fit into the Nashville songwriting way to write on Music Row. I moved here and I think I did like a hundred co-writes in the first four or five months mm -hmm. and just went crazy. And I lost, I just lost all inspiration after that. I mm -hmm. felt completely dead inside. Mm -hmm. And I was writing to, I was writing with two things in mind one for myself and also in all these co-writes i was going after tv and film because that's who i was working with at the time yep. and it was like write songs without a story and i'd just come <clears> from <throat> learning how to write story songs <laughs> yeah so i was like wait so take all the good stuff out that i love like that's why i like <clears throat> songs give us give us an ooh yeah right chorus. exactly yeah I, it just for me it was soul sucking and mm. i really had to work hard to get back to writing songs that I was passionate about. So honestly, the way that I did it was, I'm sure you've heard of the artist way, Julia Cameron. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I opened that book, did my first journal entry and my life changed because it made me just really reflect and tune into myself. And then the songs started coming and, and I got back on track, but yeah, I think being here in this community is so inspiring and also so intimidating, intimidating. Mm -hmm. And, um, I've really had to just kind of like put my blinders on in order to find myself in a creative space. Yeah. I, um, I totally, totally get you. Really? Oh I God. I think of you as so prolific. Like you are nonstop creativity. Um, that's not true at all. Um, it's just an appearance. <laughs> I like I told no. you the Morse code thing. The show um, is five years old. It's I, yeah. I mean, I started working on it so long ago and it's been so slow and I've worked on other things. But um, and I'm not going to dwell on this, but just in the sense of journeys, um, one thing that was so uh, I struggled with con and continue to struggle and don't know what's happening in the future is that for so many years I would make a record. And I would tour on that record. And like you, I mean, I, I never had a Peter, but I was just constantly booking to shows, mm -hmm. routing my own shows, mm -hmm. driving. And I mean, like, you know, like driving through Iowa and I'm like, okay, I got five hours. I can probably, and this is bad. You shouldn't drive and text at the same time or worse, write emails. But if the roads are really straight and it's a very clear day and you have to, um, I would be like, I have five hours here, I can probably write very slowly three emails, you know, in between stuff. I would just try to squeeze it out because there were so many, it was like so full time to try to keep it all going, you know? Um, but whatever, I loved th all the things we just talked about. I love sharing the songs. Um, I felt 
in my way called to do it. You know, I like I can do this. I like I really can write songs and mm-hmm. I care about it a lot. And I've spent a whole bunch of time learning how to play an instrument fairly well mm-hmm. and whatever. And that drives you. Um, and then I got interested in this uh, other stuff. And there was something about those things that are connected, which is that like I just was spending so much time in my car and driving constantly And I had no friend, like all my friends were like you Mm -hmm. and we're always gone all the time. Mm -hmm. I had no community when I came back home. When I came back home, I was just at my computer all the time. Like, and I was constantly worried about what, okay, what's happening in the fall. Okay. I got to think about, and one thing that's different, I think one thing that I've always struggled with and was never comfortable with was the, the way that you have to think kind of in levels of distance where you're like, okay, this is what's happening today. This is what's happening next week. This is what's happening next month. This is what's happening six months from now. And this is maybe what's happening a year from now. So that I'm like, and you're juggling all of those things, you know, mm-hmm. cause you're with the promoting, promoting of shows specifically mm-hmm. and booking of shows. And I never lived that way very well. It was mm-hmm. always like, lots of lost sleep and stuff. Mm. Um, but anyway, I make you feel claustrophobic almost. Yeah. Well, it just made me feel like, um, I'm not doing what I want to do with my life. That's what it made me feel like. And it made me feel like I'm not growing as a person. I'm like sustaining this and I'm paying my rent. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, like you can actually make a pretty good, like people don't know this, but you could, if you have low overhead, especially like I'm touring solo, you can make a pretty good living yeah. playing house shows. And yeah. like, it's, house it's not great. It's not terrible. Yeah. Um, but like, it doesn't really grow beyond that. Right. And so it was like constantly doing all of this to, to sustain a thing that I actually didn't like the experience of over, you know, mm-hmm. as, as time went on. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of like, well, what could I do that? I wouldn't have to travel so much that would still be really interesting to me. And, you know, I'm like such a book nerd anyway. So I all, all I ever want to do really is stay home and read, um, fiction. It's such a waste of time. It's wonderful. Um, and so that's what, but anyway, like, so as this kind of has taken off and it's gotten a little bit more momentum, there's so much more time went into that. And then with that, like that was okay. That's moving away now from music. And this is what I've known for 20 years. And now I'm not, I haven't put a song out in a, in a while I've written several songs and part of me is I'm I'm still paying for my last record, which hurts my feelings. You know, it's just like, and for what it's like, um, I don't really understand, you know, like so much has changed in our careers of like, you know, just from CDs alone to Spotify, that horrible revolution. I know. (laughs) I mean, it was just like, I did the math yesterday on what my latest record made over the past three years. And I have, been in a funk ever since I did yeah. the math. I was like, I wish I never did that. Which sounds silly that I never did. Yeah. But now that I'm going into the next record, I'm like, I should do the math. Mm. And I was like, that's depressing. It's tough, man. I mean, it's, you know, there's part of me that's just like, it's tough and it's depressing. And this is other part of me that's just like. It's the greatest thing. <laughs> well, and it's, it's just like, suck it up. You know what? Hey, yeah. guess what? Oh, too bad. The world changed yeah. and and you still need to make art and you, you know, right. like that's not changed. Artists, writers, creative people since the beginning of time have always had to figure out how to make it pay one way or another. And it's not going to be probably, you probably could make something, you could probably make a lot more living, a lot better living doing something else. Mm-hmm. Like, but it wouldn't be art. And right. so if you've got to do it, like I feel like I have to do it. I have to do it. That's just, I'm too old to do anything else. Yeah. And I, this is what I love. And I, I've never been happier in a way. And mm-hmm. I think that the same is true for you. Absolutely. You have to do it. I so do it. that's, then, then it's like, well, then the less time we both spend whining about yeah. it, it's just like, great. That's so we true. move on and figure out how to do it. Yeah. Cause you're always going to have a career because you have, zil- you have a ton of fans and not like casual fans. You have like people that love you to your bones and we'll make sure that, you know, it's going to be okay. You know, I mean, you know, this, (laughs) it's nice to hear after spending the last 24 hours crying about like, what am I doing? (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God, it sucks. (laughs) But so, okay. Um, I want to talk about this a little bit because, uh, you just mentioned you want to make a new record, but you don't want to do a crowdfunding thing because you don't want to go back to the well. You don't want to ask, but, um, you know, I, I was just talking to Kyle here because we're one thing that I've gotten excited about is this podcast thing is a new opportunity for me to do. It turns out I think a couple things I like, which is like talk to my friends mm-hmm. and also get to like, you're so wonderful. And there's, you know, people that follow me that maybe don't know you as well as they should. And so that, that's really fun for me to get to 
like beyond just the joy of getting to talk about st- something that we love. Um, but uh, in order to launch this, I'm going to do, I'm like, I'm going to do a crowdfunding thing. Mm-hmm. And I've kind of turned the corner in my head uh, from like not asking for the favor, but like inviting people to go along with the thing that I'm going to do. Yeah. And then it does like, because that is the truth. Yeah. And I know that there's some people that kind of care about what I do yeah. and they're going to want to help and they're going to, and it's, it's like, that's a different mentality. Um, I know that it's still not like putting up a record and having the, in, the, the industry put it out there and do the advertisements and all of a sudden the Spotify plays go up and you're on today. But uh, there's so much stress when you're working. It's, it's bringing on a label and doing it that way. It's just, it's, it, it honestly, I feel like it's such a better feeling to have the team of your, your listeners, you know, that to me was so much more fulfilling. Yeah. Um, it was a team effort. I don't know. The team, just, team effort between you and your fans. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was an incredible, it was an us thing, yes. right? Yeah. I mean, and that's it still is <clears> an <throat> us. It only exists because of them. It's yeah. only out in the world because of them. Yeah. You know? So, and I think that's all it's, that's all it comes down to is having that mental shift about like, oh, this is not you, you know, having a pity party. This is like, hey, let's do this thing together. Yeah. I'm ready to do this. Yeah. I'm excited about it. Yeah. Um, what that's do you think? That's what I'm hoping to get in the next couple of days. <laughs> Mental- <laughs> yeah. Mentally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, one, I had a buddy, this buddy of mine, Tim Lauer. Um, yes. He, yeah. We know Tim. He, because uh, I get real shy at times about the social media thing. I, I really don't enjoy it. I think that phones have been a net maybe negative on society and you know it's there's nothing sadder than being in a room with you know this um but whatever this is to some extent i i'm willing to play the game or i need to and there's another part of me that kind of enjoys it let's be honest (laughs) um but it's just like you know kyle and i talk about this It's just like every time you post you're just like i'm just uh, I have to do this. I'm asking for this attention. But then, uh, you know, Tim was like, dude, just think of it as like, I'm excited about this and I'm just sharing it. You know, mm-hmm. here's some, maybe you're, maybe you're excited about it too. Maybe not, yeah. but I'm excited about this. And I was like, Oh, that's very helpful because I am excited about a lot of things mm-hmm. and it's, it makes it so much easier for me to be like, I did this. And also if you, uh, that thing that you're excited about includes other people, then it's a really nice opportunity to be like, I w- had such a great time with this person and this person totally. and this person. And then it's not all about you when you're sharing that light, which thank you for doing this today. Cause that's really cool that you want to do that. Mm. with and for other creatives. <clears throat> well, I mean, maybe you had this experience along the way, but the solo singer songwriter thing um, has many uh, advantages and joys, but it is very self centered in the, mm-hmm. in just like an, uh, neutral sense yeah. you know it's just like it's your name mm-hmm. it's you you're it's doing your it songs, your it's your story, songs your, your yeah and i just was like after 20 years of that i was just like i don't fucking want to do that mm-hmm. i am so sick of that mm-hmm. it's lo- <laughs> like it's lonely either way yeah you know and that was one of the things that about film that uh the first time i was ever on set it was it changed my life forever because it was just like oh my god there's so many of us here and we all have our little job and we're all here to try to make this one thing as good as possible. And we couldn't, we need all of us. And I was like, yeah, more of that. that. And so this is kind of an, you know, an aspect of that. It's just like, I like the us part of it. It's just life's lonely enough, you know, (laughs) makes me think of marching band. I always loved being in marching band. Totally. (laughs) I think I should, I could have called you for a band geek. (laughs) Were but yeah, one? no, I wasn't, but I was a choir geek, but I mean, a variation on the thing. Um, uh, one, one more thing I want to touch on, uh, before we go, which is that you, congratulations on your recent marriage. Um, thank you. you too. Thank you. And, um, I'm just curious cause Patrick is, is so busy as well. Mm-hmm. And I assumed that he kind of managed you and he doesn't. He has his own babies to take care of. Mm -hmm. And how do you guys, how do you, does he do, do you work together in some capacity and how do you divvy up that? Like that's a kind of a little sub part of, I think what's going to be a thread in this podcast is, um, talking to various couples that I know that kind of work, if not together directly, you know, relatedly and how they negotiate that, uh, work life balance. Yeah. Um, well, I, fell in love with Patrick, um, knowing that he was an incredibly creative person and 
he made a music video for me. And when we sat down to edit it and I was hearing the way that he thinks and uh, it, that was to me, I was like, oh my gosh, what a cool person. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's always been a part of our relationship is our creative sides. He is a manager for two bands and he helps me for sure. Like the whole decision to do a Kickstarter to make that record independent, I was put my feet down, I'm Dragging, not doing it, not doing it, not doing it. And he's yeah. like, You're, you gotta do it. You know, and I've have all these old stories in my head and he helped me just, again, mind shift. Um, he is such a champion for my art and me finding the time and space for my art. And that's been amazing. And then, so we do so many creative things together. He'll do all like my design work and my, my website and my videos for Patreon and all these things. Um, and also I run all my songs by him now because he's got that Pat Patterson, um, hmm. you know, phrasing thing down. So mm-hmm. how do we keep, what was the, sorry. Well, you just like that work-life balance. I mean, yeah. this is already pretty insightful and interesting. Yeah. But I, I think we, especially now that we have a kid, we have to have like a hard cutoff time of like, okay, we're not talking about work, but we love our work. Yeah. And I love hearing about his day and his work. It's mm. so fascinating to mm. me. He is a creative, but he's also in the business side and he works with a lot of really cool artists and mm-hmm. does some cool things. So um, it is a huge thing that bonds us. But I think now that we have a kid, we're like, okay, like let's take weekends off because we could easily both just work through the weekend because we love what we do. Totally. You know? um, and he I, goes on tour with me and supports all that. So it's like a lot. Have you tou- toured with mm-hmm, our daughter? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> So he will get a nanny and then he'll run my merch and help me with the sound. Like he helps with everything. Amazing. I, don't know what I, would I mean, do without him. yeah, totally. That's yeah. enormous. And yeah. uh, what I didn't know until I was at uh, your house a yes. couple of weeks ago for that party, um, that I, I didn't realize that he had such a creative bent because I just think of oh. him as sort of like a marketing and managerial mastermind. No. And um, yeah. he's really like he's got that Instagram um, account that he does. And um, I just just that alone, I was like, OK, this makes me like you even more because this doesn't make any sense in terms of <laughs> like expanding your empire or helping your artists. This yeah. is just a thing that you do yeah. because you enjoy it. You drop yeah. pictures and have these little clever slogans underneath yes. and you've done many of them yes. and you have a, a following of people that like it. And I was just like. I want everybody in the world to have a creative outlet, you know, yeah. like it's so important to just like live in this place of, of what, what can I do? What, you know, like that mm-hmm. uncertainty thing of like, when you step out to write a song, you're like, I don't think I can, I, every time I'm like, I don't think I can do this. I don't, I don't remember how to do it. Yeah. I have, and then you sit there and something weird and magical happens mm-hmm. sometimes. And, um, you know, whatever we're trying to make a living at it. But even if you're not, mm-hmm. it's like, just, I like, I have a couple of students that I teach, um, uh, songwriting, guitar, whatever. Cool. And, um, they're one of this is kind of aspirational trying to like make it, make a living doing it or get out there and do it. Awesome. The other one just wants to do it. And it's just like, so, uh, rewarding to have a front row seat mm-hmm. to any human being that's daring to, try to string a couple lines together and like make their heart work, you know, work them their heart into it and then their voice. And it's just like, it's so it's sacred, you know, without like any sort of religious connotation. It's Mm -hmm. just like humanly sacred. Yeah. So, um, Anyway, that was supposed to be about uh, couples, but mostly. Well, tell me about how you guys, because we were kind of starting to talk about it in the kitchen. Mm. Um, just how how you guys balance your creative lives, because <clears throat> you guys are both such incredible creative forces. Well, one thing that is, I married up is my <laughs> secret. Like, I mean, seriously, Randa is a force of nature. And, um, you know, you think that I'm like busy or something. I'm like, yeah, hmm. I'm, I'm always just like trying to keep up with her ability, her just like throughput. Like when she gets going, um, it's a thing to behold. That's one part of her that I, I'm just going to speak about my wife for a moment and all the things I love about her or a few of the things, um, is her. So one of the things I love about her is how competent she is. Mm-hmm. You know, she's utterly dependable, not just to me, but to every a whole bunch of people in her life. You know, she, mm-hmm. she has a, a very uh, serious job as well. And she's just like, everybody loves her everywhere she goes. And it's because you can count on her and mm-hmm. she's s- the smartest person in the room most of the time. And like, she's, con- you know, she just does what she's going to say. All of those things. There's this other part of her that is, was really what made me be like, that is a thing that I don't have. And it's that her, she's got this like this charisma, the spontaneous charisma of, 
um, that has a social thing to it that I that I that I lack, which is like if she wants to do something and she'll she'll just like get 30 people to do it. She'll just tell them that's we're going to do. We're going to go rafting on on Saturday, two Saturdays from now. Um, are you in or out? And people are like, I don't know. Let me check it out. She's like, I'll wait. Check your calendar. But it's like so it's so <laughs> irresistible. People are like, OK, <laughs> you know? I guess I'm, like, I, uh, I'm, I'm free. Yeah, totally. She's like, great. I'll send you an invite, you know, and then all of a sudden, like, you'll get the Google invite an hour later. And oh all of a sudden, God. I mean, we so we have this. I, I'm just like so attracted to that yeah. because um, and I and part of it's like my my artist fear of like every time I play like when I play locally, I still have to get over this. I'm just like, hey, guys, I'm playing, you know, at the five spot. Yeah. They're like I have to advertise it now and really yeah. get people out there. And I'm just like, there's this, you know, whatever. She she has none of that. She's yeah. just like, so there's something really empowering about that, that I really love. Yeah. Um, the, how we work together is, um, we have, you know, we've worked, she produced Morse code, um, mm -hmm. which was our first like project. And that was right, right after we got married, like right after we got married that summer uh, after that, I was just like, I was in a weird place cause life was different now. And I had this girl that I loved and I'd thrown in with, she'd thrown in with me. I'm like, okay, that's definitely going to shift some things, you know, cause like you, I mean, I'll work from when I wake up till when right. I go to bed right. and like, that's fine. That's how I like it, mm -hmm. you know? And so there obviously had to be some shifts there mm -hmm. and I was starting to make those shifts, but then I was like watching my, you know, this thing that I have to like constantly work to make it pay mm -hmm. start to like, I'm not putting as much time into that. And I know that's going to impact, you know, the bottom line. So right. it's like, if I'm not a singer songwriter, what am I? And then I'm doing these other things. And uh, the Morse code thing was in the middle of that because I had raised um, a bunch of money to film this deal and I'd worked, there was another partner involved and I was kind of waiting for this partner to sort of step up and do what she said she was going to do, you know, and um, that wasn't happening. And I was like, like really, I like not sleeping at all and like getting up in the middle of the night, just like being a miserable person to be around basically. Mm -hmm. And she was finally like, do you, I mean, do you want, do you want me to produce it? And I was like, would you? <laughs> and she doesn't know how to produce a movie at this point. She's never done that. Um, oh and so, God. and it was just like, as soon as we started working together on that, on this pretty huge project. Um, and it was just like, so fun from moment one, because like now we have a thing that we work together on. Yeah. We have these decisions that we're doing. And with the, with film, there's this whole other thing. It's, it's so fun because there's so many people involved yeah. that like we cast the roles, you know, there was like, um, six main roles and then you know maybe four other sort of minor roles there were 500 people that submitted for it through like the the breakdown services and so that's not 500 people who auditioned like send in tapes but like i mean well over 100 people send in tapes for these roles and so oh we're just like sitting goodness. in our living room like drinking tea and like okay let's give her a check okay no 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 and we're both looks like simpatico on our opinions about stuff 99 percent of the time you know and then when somebody has a different opinion it's kind of like okay cool let's and whoever feels strongly sort of they usually went out um but then on like that was fun but then just like the sheer organizational side of it this is the part where i've never mm -hmm. oh this is a great opportunity for me to um tell my de self-deprecating story which was that um <laughs> i opened for you at uh the evening muse in charlotte one night and afterwards this is shortly afterwards or something like that um i probably had asked you some nerdy question about merch or like how you keep track of all your merch because that was another thing that was just like w did and remains elusive to me i'm just like oh i hate t-shirts <laughs> Because how do you manage the in inventory and all the sizes? And it's just like, uh, uh, Randa's helping me with that too. But anyway, <laughs> you were like, oh, I just like it. You know, when I get home from from the gig, you know, I just like to go through and like check the inventory and I count the money and like, you know, make oh sure the that's, that's 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 just what I like to do when I get home from the gig. And I was just like. When I get home from the gig, you must think I'm the best dork of all. Well, no, I was just like, when I get home from the gig, I like to have two whiskeys. <laughs> and you were like, you just looked at me like, that is so bad. That's exactly what you said. <laughs> and I was like, I know, I, I know. Okay, I think I and no, I think that's actually a, a worse story for me because it proves how much of a goody two shoes I have been for a lot of my life. But no, now I get the whiskeys. I want a whiskey every night. Yeah. But, but. I, yeah, that weird, that's like so weird how organizing is, that's what calms me down. I mean, that's um, <laughs> so great. It's such a gift. It because comes in handy, but. Like if you were, I think there's some, I know a few artists that are very organized and they, you know, maybe they like that more than the songwriting part and 
you know, maybe that shows, Mm -hmm. maybe not. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that in your case, there's no danger of whatever that that organizing organizing instinct is for you is kind of a boon to your uh, enterprise overall. Well, I think when I'm especially like during COVID, when I was stressed, that Mm. was my safe space. Like, okay, I'm just going to work on the computer. And now I've I've realized that I'm more creative at night. So when I wake up, I do my computer work. And then at night, I'm like, I need to start writing at night and that not put this pressure on myself to write during the day because it doesn't happen as easily. Mm -hmm. But it happens so much easier if the day has worn off and my creative drive, my um, organizational drive and my weirdness kind of starts to calm down a little bit as the sun goes down. That's interesting for because for me I'm the opposite because as soon as I get going on the organizational thing it's like it, okay that's my day now yeah <laughs> and so I have to do all of the I, have, I wait I'm like a wake up early guy and I do uh-huh. all of the those are like my the purity of the morning is when uh-huh. I can kind of be a weirdo and then by like ten or eleven it's like okay these emails are yeah annoying life that's how Patrick is too he wakes up and he has creative ideas and I'm <clears> like whoa how are you doing that <laughs> coffee my dear yeah. <laughs> Um, well, this has been so fun. So much fun. Thank you so much for making time Thank for me. Thank you for me. the great conversation. Yeah, it's been really great and uh, enlightening. And um, yeah, I, you know, it, I love you more than ever, really. Oh, it's just I, and, in, in, in a real way. I just have so much admiration for what you do as an artist Thank and you. your commitment to it. And um, it, it, just your skill, you know, for not just like writing song after song, but just like figuring out how to do it. It's an inspiration to people. And that was part of the reason why I wanted to have you on the podcast. So, you know, more people could get to know you and also be inspired by you and hopefully reach out and give you a high paying gig. Um, and <laughs> you are so kind. Thank you. To that end, uh, how best can people reach you or what would be, you know, like, are you, are you focusing on s- Patreon signups or yeah, okay. yeah, actually I am. Patreon is my happy place. Awesome. Um, yeah. And- Patreon.com slash Liz Longley, but I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at, at Liz Longley, L I Z L O N G L E Y. Awesome. <laughs> um, you want to play us out with one more? Sure. Do you know what it's going to be? No, I can't wait to find <laughs> out. All right. Thank you so much for having, or thank you so much for having me, Liz. <laughs> You're so used to saying that. <laughs> Thank you for having me. All right. Let's do it again. You're welcome for being here. Yes. Thank (laughs) you. Just kidding. I wrote this um, for my husband and um, going into our relationship, I just wanted to have a a fresh start for myself because I didn't want to take all my old baggage of how I was in old relationships into a new one with him. Um, So I wanted to love him with a heart of a child, which is the title of this Like I've never been broken Never been blue Never given everything Only just to lose Like I've never fallen And had to get right back up Like I've never been foolish And forced to grow up I'm gonna love you with a heart of a child I'm gonna love you with a heart of a child Quick to forgive Quick to forget No keeping score Never in debt I'll unguard my weakness and show you all of me with no inhibition, fearless and free. I'm gonna love you with the heart of a child. I'm gonna love you with the heart of a child. Some days will be
will be sunny and some will be tough I'll never wonder if our love is enough I'll just keep on giving I keep seeing it through I'll never give up Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked what you saw, click the subscribe button or you can watch this video right here. Did I do it right? Is that, is that okay? Okay. <laughs>